towards about August 6th and 9th, they marked the 79th anniversary since the United States dropped atomic bombs on Hiroshima and Nagasaki, annihilating instantly <coughs> an estimated 170,000 people. And then, of course, tens of thousands of others since have died from radiation poisoning and injuries. American military leaders from all branches of the armed forces strongly dissented from the decision to drop the atomic bomb, some before August 1945 and others after, for both military and also moral reasons. On Armistice Day, 1948, Army General Omar Bradley captured the soulless militarism ruling the U.S. government. He said, ours is a world of nuclear giants and ethical infants. We know more about war than we know about peace. Yes. More about killing than we know about living. And hasn't that prevailed since? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Our program opens with a proclamation by Mayor Ginny Disorder of Greenfield. And it will be read by her staff. And this states that Greenfield proclaims August 6th and 9th to be <coughs> lifting community voices for a world free of nuclear weapons day. And so her staff here, where is he? <laughs> Oh, <laughs> no wonder I couldn't see you. So you introduce yeah. yourself. Good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Keith Barnacle. I am uh, Chief of Staff to the May to Mayor Disorder and work at City Hall. Um, I'm here this morning to thank you for your presence. Thank you for being here. Thank you for bringing light and information to this important issue and to read a proclamation on behalf of the mayor, who, again, apologizes that she couldn't be here personally today. but. Um, it's here in spirit. Um, so this is from uh, the city of Greenfield declaring August 6, 2024 and August 9, 2024 as a world free of nuclear weapons day, whereas 79 years ago, on August 6th and August 9th, hundreds of thousands of human beings died, many instantly, or, su or suffered severe health consequences in the cities of Hiroshima and Nagasaki, Japan, where the unit, when the United States dropped atomic bombs. Whereas many people and communities within the United States have been and continue to be grievous, grievously harmed and suffer health consequences from the development, production, and testing of nuclear weapons and uranium mining. Whereas nine nations collectively, collectively have approximately 12,100 nuclear weapons in their arsenals most of which are more destructive than those used against the people of Japan, and the detonation of even a small number of these weapons could affect everyone on the planet, causing catastrophic human and environmental, and environmental consequences that would threaten human civilization itself. Whereas Greenfield, Massachusetts is a co-sponsor of the <coughs> Weapons to Windmill Bill in the Massachusetts Legislature, a bill calling for citizen hearings throughout the state regarding converting state nuclear weapon spending to sustainable energy to address the climate crisis. Whereas the city of Greenfield is a member of Mayors for Peace with 222 other US cities and 8,247 cities in 166 countries, which annually call for the elimination of nuclear weapons. Yes. Whereas the people of Greenfield join with the people of Hiroshima in their call that all cities and citizens of the world unite together in expanding the circle of solidarity, transcending national boundaries, partisan politics, and religious creeds to strengthen the bond of human friendship and solidarity. Now therefore, be it resolved, I, the Mayor of Greenfield, do hereby <coughs> proclaim April, August 6th and August 9th to be world free of nuclear weapons day and encourage everyone in the community to promote justice and harmony amongst us all. Sincerely, Virginia Disorder, Mayor. Yeah. <laughs> Thus far, that have a 
established proclamations by that. East Hampton is one and in Massachusetts, and, and uh, Greenfield is the next. If you live in any other town other than those two and are interested in talking with your either mayor or with your board of select persons, town council, etc., you could just be in touch uh, with me through, through Track Rock because we have all the language for these proclamations. They vary with the town. And the town, I mean, at least we have a skeleton, but then things can be added to it. So we're very proud. Thank you, Keith. He's the facilitator for the mayor. Thank you. Um, Thanks, Keith. And also, Greenfield is a mayor's for peace city, uh, which most people were not aware of, including the past few mayors and this one. It was in 2005. And so that, if, if that happens, it has to be sort of revived. Mm -hmm. And but um, it, it was started by uh, the mayor of Hiroshima. I don't know what year, but today the goal is to try to get 10,000 cities in as many countries as possible <coughs> throughout the world. All right. So um, our next uh, section here is to honor the ethical giant, Randy Keeler. Yes. Followed, followed, he is followed by respected activists and members of our larger, larger community. That is, when we speak about him, he's followed by Pocky Whelan of Code Pink and Women Say No to NATO, which is what she's going to speak about. War tax resistor Aaron Falbel, a wonderful writer, if you've seen his, his pieces in, in the reporter, and Kato Shonen of the New England Peace Pagoda with a very inspiring speech that some of us heard uh, last week at the Pagoda. So with Randy, he was, and all of this is familiar to many of you, but nonetheless, it's inspiring to see a life condensed into the few things that I will speak about. He was the first director of the Trap Rock Center for Peace and Justice beginning in 1979. And he was executive director of the National Nuclear Weapons Freeze Program campaign in the 1980s. He was an eminent pacifist whose exemplary life affected and influenced thousands of pacifists. In 1969, he returned his draft card in protest of the Vietnam War and spent 22 months in prison after refusing his induction order. Hearing Keeler speak about the government's retribution against him was seminal in Daniel Ellsberg's decision to release the Pentagon Papers. If only that, his, his life, his life would be hard. For Keeler's and his wife Betsy Corner's refusal to pay federal income taxes in protest of military spending on war, their house was seized by the federal government in 1989. For all those he inspired, his ethical stands and actions on behalf of creating a culture of peace live on. They live on through us and many, many, many others. We have a few minutes. If anyone would like to offer uh, a memory or uh, something about Randy that was so important for you. Yes, right. I, yeah, Annie, um, I knew him really well. I remember the last uh, gathering that I was with him was at, uh, up on the hill for the Native Americans. Uh, we were talking in a room about uh, peace and justice, and his last thing was uh, you didn't want to become complacent. Complicit, complicity. I hope I'm saying that right. That, that's uh, that's what he uh, was thinking about. You know, he was he was moving and shaking and speaking and being right till his last time. I'm sure. And, and his message was, "Don't cry for him. Don't cry for him." Uh, I also believe that about the house. I was part of that, circling around and. I believe this is true, that Randy and Betsy, I think, felt fine with having those people stay in the house. 
and they were going to do another house. And uh, that's who he was. I mean, he, he got so big spiritually that... Uh, mm -hmm. Anyway, I know I'm going to be bold, but I have a song. Just a quick... I have to. I have to. He asked me, you know, I tried to sneak by, and he wasn't feeling good. And he said, is there any, any acid? I go, dang. I think if I just said, will you sing at my funeral? And I said, yes, but I have a song. It's uh, by my muse. I think it would be really appropriate for today. We shall be known by the company we keep, by the ones that circle round to tend these fires. We shall be known by the ones that sow and reap the seeds of change that lie from deep within the earth. It is time now, it is time for us to thrive. It is time we bring ourselves into the Tomato. 
is the vibrant peace movement centered in Western Europe that is most the most critical voice and movement countering the growing militarism of NATO, both in Western Europe and in the Pacific. Thanks. And I, I, what I was thinking about today, I went back to a, a comment that Albert Einstein made after Hiroshima and Nagasaki. And he said, if we want to oppose this, uh, if we want to oppose any further use of nuclear weapons, we must take it to the village square. Now, early on, in artificial intelligence said, oh, God, you have to look for the nerd of the town. Uh, but we know better than that, because the village square is right here. Mm -hmm. We are the village square. We're here wherever people come together to say no and to say yes, to do, to embody what, what Leslie was showing us of, of Randy Wheeler, <laughs> saying no to war and yes to peace. So here we are. Uh, in our village square, and, uh, and just look around for a moment at all the beautiful squares, all the beautiful people who are part of our village square. And know that we're not only here, but we're all over the world, thanks to the brothers and sisters of people, the siblings in Hiroshima and Nagasaki, who demanded that this never be forgotten. And, and thank you for bringing this to us from Japan. And, and for your presence, the Japanese presence in our valley. But uh, enough about that, because uh, one of the ways we say no is by learning more, and, and where, where do we say no? And a few years ago, I, I hadn't thought much about NATO. Uh, yes, I knew. Yes, it was started a uh, North American, North Atlantic Treaty Organization to confront the Warsaw Pact. Uh, many of us remember there was once a Cold War seems it's coming back, but um, it's in conflict right now with the hot wars. But um, So I, I hadn't thought much about NATO. And a few years ago, somebody reminded me that, that it's really doing some very nefarious things. And I had the opportunity, as, as Pat noted, to, uh, to go to, to Europe, to go to Madrid two years ago when the uh, NATO people were gathering there to celebrate their wonderful existence, that NATO is actually there, they say, to, uh, to keep us protected. Now, of course, we all know that the Warsaw Pact that it was created to confront is, was dissolved many years ago. But um, the, uh, the NATO keeps going, and it's expanded much beyond the North Atlantic. It's all over Latin America, and particularly, as Pat noted, in the Pacific. Um, so what they've discovered is that, and, and Stoltenberg, who this, this year, NATO celebrated its 75th anniversary in Washington, D.C. And Stoltenberg, who was then still the, the head of, of, of NATO, said, we have uh, the strength forever, and we have all the people, the, the members of NATO, contributing monetarily to the, uh, to the weaponry, and it's all being bought at the United States, that companies in the United States are making all the weapons mm -hmm. that are being bought by all these people. And, and the, uh, imagine, I mean, just for a second, think about that, the audacity of even saying that, how, how profane that is. Mm -hmm. so, so here in our village, we're saying, please, let's stand up against NATO, um, even though we know part of that the Trump people uh, are against NATO too, and, uh, and for very different reasons that I don't need to go into. Um, we've been told that NATO is really a, the good guys. Um, there's lots of documentation to show that it is not. Uh, I encourage you to read everything you can to, to search it out. And, and in fact, there's even good documentation that says that NATO was, of course, a, a precipitant uh, to the war between Russia and Ukraine. And, and incredibly, there is good information that after two months, the Ukrainians and Russians said, what are we doing? Uh, we need to negotiate. This is crazy. We've been here before. We know what this is. And who said, don't do it? 
Mm -hmm. United States. NATO and the United States right. put so much pressure on Zelensky, our puppet, that, uh, that the war has continued. <coughs> and, and I want to just say that the sad part is our, our, our representative, who is much beloved by many of us, uh, got seduced to, uh, to support the U.S. And, and Ukraine continuing the war. And, uh, and so we have to challenge him on that because he, he's, he's got a good heart. And, uh, and this is one of the things we need to remind him, that, uh, that if you want to stop the killing, you stop the killing. You don't do more. Okay. So I'll end with this. Um, there's uh, a, a, a proclamation of the, the uh, Women Against NATO that I, I, everybody's been invited to take a, a copy of. Uh, there's more information about Women Against NATO. And there's the opportunity to become, if, if you've seen the material or you know that, of course, I've, I've signed that, you can sign, you can become a signatory to the, uh, to the, the contract that says, yes, we are opposed to NATO, and it's not just women, anyone can sign that. Mm -hmm. so, uh, so thank you. Uh, do we have one minute? <laughs> I just want to say one more thing. Uh, you know, one, one of the things that happened besides that wonderful comment of, of Einstein was Eisenhower who, who reminded us to be aware of the military industrial complex. And, uh, and it, it, in fact, when he was leaving office and, and said that, he had actually said, beware the military industrial congressional complex. And he was told, oh, we can't do that. We can't do that. Well, we know that in every congressional district there is some kind of armament, some kind of defense contract. So, um, so our brilliant friend, Ray McGovern, who for years was in the CIA, and, and actually did some good things there, um, and is now a, a wonderful peace activist, he started a, 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 came up with another solution, another, another acronym, beyond MIC, and it's the military industrial complex, it's Mickey Mac, and, and as we see what's happening on our campuses, when we see what's happening in our cities, when we see what's happening all over the country. I just want to remind you that we need to be aware of Mickey Mac, and that is the Military Industrial Congressional Intelligence Media Academic Think Tank Complex. Yeah. Woo! Think about that. And we just, because it's everywhere, and, uh, but we are too. And, uh, and God bless everybody in our village. Are there any questions uh, for Poppy besides the one I have? <laughs> okay, yes, Anna. I'd just like to say there's an excellent website, No to NATO, mm -hmm. with videos in all languages. Thank you, Poppy. Thank you. So, Poppy, my question is. Are there women in Women Say No to NATO in every country, from every country in Western Europe? Yes, yes, throughout Western Europe and, and in other parts of the country. We've had webinars leading up to this with women in Africa, in Latin America, and in the Middle East. So, yes, 40 countries. Yes. So, There's women in 40 countries. So, as the old saying goes, we are everywhere, and you can join us. Thank you. And another question. Sure. Yes, Paki, uh, how does NATO now connect with the current the situation in Palestine and Gaza and the West Bank? I, I don't have the details, but, but the, the idea, NATO's a tool for Western hegemony, for U.S. hegemony, for world dominance. Mm -hmm. That's what it's all about. And, uh, and their biggest activities of late have been in the Pacific. What the hell is NATO doing in the Pacific? Could you elaborate on that? Yes, the RIMPAC mm -hmm. is, is, the, is the organization that's, that's the, uh, the group of the Pacific uh, that's, that's doing the same things that, that uh, they do these war games, and they call them war games. Mm -hmm. And imagine, I mean, we, we're also aware of, what, of, of this world we live on. And, and part of their war games is bombing ships and sinking them with all kinds of weapons in, in the sea. 
that is, you know, the, the, we used to think of it as just, just internal, but it's not. Yeah. You know, so so it's it's and what is and why are these war games even happening? You know, this is this is really a rhetorical question we can think about. Why? And uh, and we, I don't know specifically what it's doing, except uh, I would bet it's there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So well, thank you, Pop. Thank you. And so next we have Aaron Powell. And Aaron, where are you? Mm -hmm. Okay. <laughs> okay. So Aaron is a vortex redistrict. He's an inspired political writer and had a unique bond of friendship with Randy Keeler, of, of which he will also speak. So Aaron, thank you. Thank you, Pat and Anna, for inviting me. I'm going to make three points this morning. I'd like to contemplate for a bit on this phrase, nuclear weapons, and what that means. Then I would like to ask the question, not what these devices do to their victims, which we know already and which has been spoken of and which has been studied well, but what do they do to us? What does their possession do to our hearts? And lastly, I would like to say a few words about my friend Randy Keeler. The philosopher and historian Ivan Illich once raised the question, or noted, that this phrase nuclear weapons is something of an oxymoron, a misnomer. Because as he understood the term, a weapon <laughs> is something you can aim at somebody, whether it be an enemy combatant or a person you're trying to hold up or whatever it is. But these nuclear devices, we can't aim at any entity because they make no discrimination between civilian and combatant. They destroy everything and everyone. Men, women, children, animals, trees, buildings, everything. So Illich said, no, they're not weapons. They are instruments of genocide. That's what they really are. Just like Auschwitz was an instrument of genocide. Nuclear weapons act a lot quicker. They're instantaneous genocide. Auschwitz took a little bit longer to accomplish its goals, but did the same goals. So Illich asked the question, can you imagine our leaders or politicians building concentration camps, extermination camps, equipped with their gas chambers and crematoria and their cyclone B gas or whatever the current poison might be, just to have them ready in case we might need them, or perhaps to use them as a threat? Wouldn't you say that such a person is mad to suggest such a thing? Visitors who have actually been to Auschwitz or any of the other camps and have seen the gas chambers and the crematoria and the piles of bones and the jewelry extracted from the corpses, including dental fillings or the lampshades or other tools made from their remains, they ask the question, how could people do this? How could they? participate in such horror. Yet when we think about these nuclear devices, we have our leaders and many people of the public to say, well, these things are necessary to keep the peace. But they do the same thing as Auschwitz. Genocide is illegal under current international law. And therefore, says Ellis, so should nuclear weapons be illegal under current international law. Mm -hmm. So now I want to ask the question, what do they do to us? This mindset of keeping them around. Another good friend of mine, who was also a student of Illich's, Eugene Burkhardt, wrote a book called Bearing Witness. And in that book is a small chapter called Memories and the Ethic of Hiroshima. I'm just going to read the last few sentences of it because it addresses that very question. 
The atomic bombing of Hiroshima announced to the world in a bold and dramatic fashion a very different new type of ethic, one claiming to be more suitable for the technological age into which we had entered. In this ethic, the killing of civilians and children is permissible. Actions formerly thought to be reprehensible were now condoned if they could be shown to achieve a higher goal. This is the ethic that says the ends justify the means. The ethic of Hiroshima has deeply penetrated American society, becoming, becoming a prominent one in both the public and private realm. But beware, the belief that the ends justify the means is a more deadly poison than the radioactive fallout from the mushroom cloud. It can make us into frightful, frightful mutants, far removed from the kinds of persons we originally were created to be. Renounce and reject it with all your strength. I sent this book to my friend Randy Keeler shortly after it came out in 2014, because I thought he would appreciate the book, the entire book. And he called me up afterwards <coughs> to say thank you. <coughs> And he immediately gravitated to that one little essay and read to me over the phone the words I just read to you now mm -hmm. with tears coming down his face. Now, those of you who knew Randy knew that he cried very easily. He was a very sensitive person. He cared about many things. But anything that pulled at his heartstrings, whether beautiful or horrible, would cause him to get all choked up. And he read that exact passage to me over the phone said, that is so true, that is so true. So yes, Randy was a person of conscience. He listened to that little voice inside himself that told him what was right and wrong, and he acted upon it. He was, I would say, a virtuoso performer of the art of nonviolent direct action. Some who didn't understand him very well would dismiss him, calling him a draft dodger, a tax cheat, or just a, a troublemaker. But he was none of those things. He wasn't dodging anything. He didn't go off to Canada. He stood his ground. He said exactly why he was not going to cooperate with the Vietnam War why he was not going to cooperate with the Selective Service. And he was willing to pay the price for it, 22 months in prison, as, as Pat mentioned. He didn't keep any of the money that he and Betsy withheld from the Pentagon. They sent all of it away to victims of war abroad, as well as victims of war here. And that the victims of war here were not only the veterans that came back with missing limbs and psychologically destroyed. But the other Eisenhoweran vet victims, and what I mean by that is I'm referring to that quote, not the military industrial complex one, but one that he spoke in 1953 on April 16th, just after tax day. And he said, this is only three months into his presidency, every gun that is made, every warship launched, Every rocket fired signifies, in the final sense, a theft from those who hunger and are not fed, those who are cold and are not clothed. This world in arms is not spending money alone. It is spending the, the sweat of its laborers, the genius of its scientists, the hopes of its children. So Randy and Betsy, in their act of war tax refusal and war tax redirection, try to address that by placing their own personal wealth where their hearts were, redirected it to where it needs to go. Not killing people, but helping people. What could be more simple? That was their act of conscience, which I continue 
and I urge everyone else who might think of continuing such an act in Randy's honor to contemplate that. Thank you. Thank you. It's right across from Hospital Hill. If you know, if you know Northampton at all, it's Route 66. It goes out of Northampton. Hospital Hill is on the right, and L3 Harris, this prime location, prime real estate, is right there, overlooking the, the valley. And um, and there are people who every there's a, a group. It's the the, uh, the demilitarized people and the uh, the Lady Fast people, Nick Modern mm -hmm. and. Uh, Jen yeah. Scarlett and Jean Allen. Allen were the three people who started that. They're, they're doing the Lady Fast. And, um, so so th that's a possibility coming at 7.30, 7.30? It starts uh, uh, oh, 6.30 to 7.15 every Wednesday morning. Mm -hmm. We would love for anybody who mm -hmm. wants to do that. Yes. Us. Could I suggest that anyone interested would talk to you afterwards? Sure. Okay. Either of us. Yes. yes. Okay. Yeah. Could I also say, though, Pat, that it turns out that um, Massachusetts is one of the centers of weapons manufacturing in the country. Yeah. In the country. And I think that besides, I, I think that there are people protesting everywhere from General Dynamics in Lynn to Raytheon at UMass to L3 Harris to Elbit. And I think, and I'm trying to encourage getting together a network of all of us to do a united campaign against these weapons, mm -hmm. whether they be little teeny tiny parts or big ones. Mm -hmm. And Soren Anderson. Anderson <laughs> Flynn is actually beginning a study. It turns out that there is a whole supply chain up and down the Connecticut River, mm. in particular, <coughs> that's supplying Pratt and Whitney. Mm -hmm. Wow. So we need to focus on our local, but we also need to understand that as a state, this is our major interest industry, mm -hmm. researching and producing weapons. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I'll also add that the proclamation that Keith Barnacle read today, signed by the mayor and also the East Hampton mayor, those go to our state as well as federal congressionals. And so a combination of that kind of political action as well as, as these uh, together would um, I mean, just amplify each other. 
And may I also add that not only are Greenfield and East Hampton members of Bears for Peace, uh, there's something like 12 cities in Massachusetts, mm -hmm. including Worcester and places that most of us don't ever go near. Yeah. And, and that's another <coughs> network here. Mm -hmm. Wait, the Mayors for Peace is another network. In Massachusetts. There are a couple of organizers or people who work for, uh, back from the brink um, and, and are interested in working in cities with Mayors for Peace. Someone here, okay, there you are. Just identify yourself. Uh, Bruce Stedman. Bruce Stedman. Um, and so if you are from a town other than uh, Greenfield and East Hampton and interested in pushing this with your mayor or town council, if Bruce is still here when we finish, you I'll can be speak. here. Okay, speak with him. And I have the list of the cities as well. Okay. And those who were mayor now five years ago. Mm -hmm. Sister Claire has her hand up. I just, just want to say that tomorrow we're walking from Amherst Town Hall to L3 Harris. Um, if anybody wants to join. But what time is that? Uh, yeah, I to, well, I know we're gathering at 9, starting to walk at 9 from Amherst Town Hall. I, I don't know what time you get to L3 Harris. Mm -hmm. um, but we would love, I, I apologize for that. We were very tender mm -hmm. for the others. Um, gathering. We didn't organize as well as we should, but um, it's just straight down Route 9 and up 63. Um, I think it's eight miles, and <coughs> so we will stop for a little lunch. But we would love more people to join us and um, you know, bring the signs. And um, I've talked a little bit with Fergus, um, Fergus Marshall, but. I'm going to talk again with him. Oh, what did you say? I have talked a little bit with Fergus Marshall. Yeah. And I, I have to catch up with him again about tomorrow. But anyway, everybody welcome. Even if you just, you know, Do the church. half yeah. gather and town half fall and walk half a mile. Absolutely. Yeah. That's beautiful. Uh, you know, bring our energies together. I mean, I, I really want to support the weekly uh, stand up to general prayer that you're having on Wednesday mornings. <clears throat> but this is one very much in connection with this awakening, reawakening around Hiroshima. And I do, my understanding is that L3 Harris um, makes these component parts that have, uh, it's very hard to uh, get, you know, they have been used uh, against the people in Gaza. Yes. Um, L3 Harris, we don't know about this particular, uh, you know, what exactly they do, but but the company nationally uh, is very very involved in that. So, so check check with those two people, Deb and Greg, the vast people who are here who have been very involved with L3 Harris. The uh, the local air L3 Harris in Northampton apparently, according to Nick Motern, make. Um, Periscopes for submarines and targeting equipment for naval guns. That's as far as we know. But they're part of a whole, obviously. Yeah, Fifty thousand employees. Oh, nationwide. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. It's valuable. And I just want to say, demilitarize Western Mashing. Google it. It's on X. We have a you know a, a Twix, formerly Twitter. And you can, there's a link tree, on, probably on Instagram as well, Instagram, yeah. a link tree, and you can hit the link tree, and you will get a bunch of information about our this organization and how to connect with us. Yeah, thank you. And I won't be happy to talk with you as well. So we will finish with Kato Shannon, and he is senior monk of the New England Peace Pagoda in Leverett. And he will read an inspiring and unifying statement given last week at the 40th anniversary of the founding of the Peace Pagoda. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, <coughs> thank you very much. I'm very honored. What you described is a very um, okay. Um, Description, description 
for what you will work on thing five. It was <coughs> Mahatma Gandhi and our teacher, Manisha <coughs> Dasu Fuji, who immediately realized what that man in nuclear <coughs> attack meant. And uh, they thought that humanity had a choice, only choice, non-violence or annihilation. And that is still true and more true today, so obviously. I was born in 1940 and turned five years old when two atomic bombs were dropped over Hiroshima and Nagasaki. <clears throat> that ended the Second World War and the United States military occupation of Japan began. Since the Second World War, the United, United States has been continually fighting wars. And it is because of the United States' history of violence, beginning with the violent conquest of native people, attempting to sunder the relationship with Mother Earth and breaking down the spiritual culture, which gave relationship and meaning to the people that the United States assumed the post World War II role of instigating war after war in the last 70 plus years. <clears throat> Initially, the Cold War grew and nuclear weapons escalated. The survival of humanity was in danger. Our teacher, most venerable Nishida Fuji, said at that time that <clears throat> in order to bring the world to peace, we had to convert the United States and Soviet Union to be peaceful countries. Converting the United States to be a peace-loving country can be done only by the people of this country. He believed that the indigenous people of Great Tato Island held the way of balance and sacredness sacredness with the land and the people here for millennium and still keep the way of prayer even under the attack of colonization. He also often called for the coming together of Native Americans, African Americans, and all awakened people living on this land in order to collaborate for peace and righteousness. <coughs> for decades, the United States <coughs> has been spending over half of all taxes for military war greater than combined spending of almost all the other countries. That means that this country has come under the power of the military industrial <coughs> interests. It is not exaggerating 
to say that military industry complex have taken over this nation. Since, as many of you are aware, the assassination of JFK. Mm -hmm. it, it seems the task is difficult, but it is up to us, the people, to, to prepare spiritually. It is a matter of changing the mind to respect the arts and awaken the yearning for peace. It is possible for this to become normal in this country on great part of island. We can do this by sincerely committing more and more to cultivate beloved community never losing the vision of the whole, as our great brother, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. called for. <clears throat> it has to be a joy to deeply and fully engage ourselves in this moment, movement. <coughs> Nam myo o renge yo Nam myo o renge yo Nam myo o renge yo
to know this is very uh, a nice, wonderful blessing from them. Good morning, friends. Good morning. We collectively are walking around the world to spread the message of peace and harmony, non-violence, peace and harmony. Every year we spend four or five months walking around various parts of the world. This time we are walking in USA for two and a half months. We are walking in Canada for about 20 days. And on the way back we are going to walk for 15 days in UK. Our complete focus is to spread message of non-violence, peace and harmony, what Gandhi gave to this world. And when we were finalizing walk plan for US, we realized that Gandhi's work inspired Martin Luther King, a local leader. So we have titled our walk as Gandhi Martin Luther Peace Walk. Today is our 10th day. And I had personal desire to walk into Tokyo to Hiroshima Nagasaki with message of peace. For various reasons, it could not happen. So I'm so delighted to be part of this group today here. <laughs> we want to be, it's, it's really in a way dream coming true. So we took a break from our walk from Washington DC. We came down here. We'll, after these five days, we'll go back to DC and continue our walk towards Dallas and 3rd September, we're going to close in Dallas. And then we're going to fly off to UK, I'm sorry, uh, Canada, where we're walking from Pugwash to Halifax for 20 days. Again, the purpose of the walk is to spread non-violence, peace, and harmony. Then we're coming back in US on West Coast, starting from Seattle, going to California. And then finally, on 31st October, we close our US walk and fly off to UK, spend about 15 days from 2nd November to 15 November. And just our intention is to put seeds of love everywhere. And who knows which seed will germinate into a you know, peace plant. So that, that's our endeavor. And we seek blessing from each one of you guys. Thank you. Thank you. 